1992. Despite the full cooperation of the American forces in the hunt for Pablo Escobar, the drug boss remains at large and protected by his powerful Medellin cartel. Escobar was the head of a very large criminal organization. So he employed not just uh, gunmen and hitmen and criminals, but also bankers and lawyers and accountants. He had an infrastructure in Medellin. So we started targeting other members of his organization. We began to systematically cut away all of his support mechanisms, all of his infrastructure. We built up a large body of intelligence, put together organization charts down to the lowest lieutenant in his organization. Escobar responds by putting a price tag on the head of Medellin police officers. <laughs> He was killing regular police officers, nothing to do with the search block, just a regular police officer on the beat. Every day there were funerals for policemen that were killed the night before. Pablo was able always to stay one step ahead of the search block because he had a lot of friends and informants, both in the community and also within the search block itself. There was a lot of information that was being intercepted, which suggested a lot of people on the take. If you didn't take the money, he would shoot you. You know, plata or plomo. You know, you want a bullet or you want some money. We knew that we could be infiltrated. The Medellin cartel members were constantly looking for someone they could bribe monetarily. It became apparent to the Americans and to the Colombians searching for Escobar that the tactics they were using were never going to be successful. In the days after Escobar's escape from his private prison in July of 1992, the DEA had toured the site in search of any intelligence that they could possibly use against the drug lord. We went through the prison where he had lived, found great intelligence, uh, just great information. One of the things that they noticed about Escobar as they examined his living quarters and his memorabilia was how much his life revolved around his family and his children. I was always of the opinion that we should watch his family, track his family, because he had the reputation of being uh, an absolutely ruthless, murderous man, but the man who really had great regard for his family, for his wife and his two children. Ambassador Busby shared his thoughts with the Colombian authorities. I talked to the Colombians about that and said, you know, I think this will make him uneasy and perhaps have him you know, stick his head up and we'll be able to see him. January 30th, 1993. A 220-pound car bomb explodes in front of a bookstore in downtown Medellin. It killed scores of people, many of them children, shopping for school supplies. And I think it was really the point at which the gloves came off in the search for Pablo Escobar. In the subsequent days, more bombs go off in Colombia. This time, however, the bombs are targeting Pablo's family. A bomb blows up a 12-story apartment building owned by Pablo's mother. Soon, another Escobar house is decimated. An organization calling itself Los Pepes came out of the woodwork. A mysterious entity begins targeting Pablo's organization, and even his family, for outright assassination. Los Pepes, which stood for, in its acronym, People Persecuted by Pablo Escobar, suddenly burst on the scene, targeting and assassinating anyone who was associated with Escobar. It had the earmarks of a psychological operation of some sort. But it got very quickly beyond that, and it became a murderous bloodbath. People being killed by the Pepe's almost every night. They ran the whole gamut of crimes. So you know, in reality, Los Pepe's were just as ruthless as Escobar. Anybody who had uh, any connection with Escobar was either killed, arrested, or running for their lives. Personally, I thought he was going to taste of his own medicine. Let's just call another flank he had to worry about. 
the police, you know, never did stuff like this. I mean, he was always worried about the police, but now you have Los Pepes playing uh, outside the rules. They started to play dirty, just like Escobar. They were killing as many as five and six people a day. They would assassinate these people and leave signs hanging around the neck of the body, uh, signed Los Pepes. While Los Pepes is exterminating Escobar's support structure, the search block takes down some of Pablo's top lieutenants, such as Tyson Munoz. The search block raided the apartment, cornered Tyson, and killed him in the proverbial gun battle with the Colombian police. The confrontation was pretty much inevitable because these people were not going to be taken alive. In my opinion, the police did not want to take him alive either because the wheels of justice don't work in Colombia the way they do in the United States. Despite an official prohibition, many of the American forces are rumored to be participating in the search block raids. Delta Force operators and the DEA agents very frequently went along on these raids and often led them. We couldn't stand back and feed this, them this information about a potential Escobar hideout and expect them to go out and participate in all the dangerous activities while we sat in the rear, you know, and drank our coffee and waited for them to come back and report to us. So Javier and I decided ourselves that we would be involved in these operations. And right there on the front lines with the guys, running in, kicking the doors, going in, participating right alongside the Columbia National Police. With Americans funding, training, and possibly even participating in search block raids, concern grows over a possible connection between the search block and the death squad, Los Pepes. There were allegations on the part of Pablo that um, Los Pepes and Martinez were one and the same. I was very much afraid of somehow DEA being contaminated by what was going on up there. There's been accusations that members of the Bloque de Busqueda provided information to Los Pepes. Did I ever see that? No. Did I ever see any indication that that happened? No. Could it happen? Sure, it could happen. You know, there's 600 guys in that operation. It's still something of a mystery uh, who Los Pepes were. And that's obvious because the Los Pepes were basically murdering people. One of the few to admit to participating in the killings is Escobar's former ally, Carlos Castaño. Los Pepes is an organization that arose supported by the auto defenses. Yes, particularly by my brother Fidel Castaño, that he was bigger. Carlos Castaño and his brother Fidel were some of the original paramilitary units uh, created to fight against the guerrillas. When Escobar began executing members of his own organization inside his private prison, La Catedral, the survivors began to secretly ally themselves with Pablo's paramilitaries against the drug lord. Pablo Escobar killed most of his friends and allies and his pals. But there were relatives that survived that lunatic and they joined us. The drug traffickers said, we're sick and tired of this guy, we're going after him. And they created the Pepes, and they attacked him exactly the way he used to work against society and against them. We realized that he was a monster that we had to fight against no matter what. So when they turned against him, they knew the inner workings of his organization. They knew who the people were, where the money was. Los Pepes reportedly received support from Pablo's chief business rival, the Cali Cartel. The Cali Cartel was more than happy to help Los Pepes or the search block or the Colombian government go after Escobar because he was their primary rival. And by eliminating the Medellin Cartel, it just made for a more lucrative business for them. Colonel Martinez and the U.S.-backed search block are rumored to be cooperating with Los Pepes. Colonel Martinez was at this point, even though he denies it, I think, uh, was willing to work with these elements from the underworld because for him, uh, the battle with Escobar had become very personal. You could say that Escobar affected all of us, 
who were Los Pepes members. Los Pepes. When things started to get really ugly, when Los Pepes began killing people wholesale, it was clear to the Americans working in Bogota that this was out of bounds. And if word got back to Washington that the United States effort was connected in any way to these death squads, then Washington would basically pull the plug on American involvement. This threw something into the game which, which really could have brought everything to a grinding halt. Mark Bowden's Killing Pablo cites classified cables outlining the American concerns about Los Pepes. While the United States Embassy in Bogota maintained the pretense that there was no connection whatsoever between Colonel Martinez's search block and Los Pepes, I came across the DEA's uh, cable traffic back and forth from Bogota to Washington, which documents the knowledge of DEA agents that uh, Los Pepes were intimately involved with the search block. Ambassador Busby himself wrote a rather lengthy cable to Washington where he details the fact that their own intelligence showed that there was a connection between Los Pepes and the search block. In fact, Ambassador Busby had gone to President Gaviria to complain about this and to demand that this connection cease and desist. I had uh, several meetings, and one of them, I want you to say every member of the police that we don't that this is not an instruction, that this is not the policy, that we, don't, we shouldn't be involved in that. Days after Gaviria's orders to the police, Los Pepes issue a press communique announcing they are officially disbanding. And in effect, for a period of time, Los Pepes did cease and desist. So it was obvious that they understood that, that there was a connection between the police and Los Pepes. Though officials moved to distance themselves from the vigilante group, Los Pepes continue their bloody campaign. Los Pepes were the first tactic employed against Escobar that was immediately effective. Uh, in short order, everybody associated with Escobar, his family members, his lawyers, his bankers, his accountants, were either running for their lives or, or dead or under arrest. And, and, and very quickly, Pablo began to uh, find that his protective shell was disintegrating. We confronted Escobar's terrorists. There were a lot of killings during this confrontation. We could see that the impact that they were having was incredible because they were playing without any rules. Officially, the United States was not involved in the efforts of Los Pepes at all. But if you look at what they were doing in Colombia at the time, it's clear that they were working hand in hand with Los Pepes, whether they intended to or not. It was very evident that they were having tremendous success in dismantling the Medellin organization. And obviously, you know, we were trying to do the same thing. There was a strategy, wide, perfect, outlined by the United States, by these agencies in which tacitly each one did what each one had to do. By February of 93, Los Pepes have killed dozens of Escobar's associates and members of his extended family. So Pablo is now terrified that Los Pepes are going to kill his wife and children. I got a phone call. Um, almost a frantic phone call from uh, the Minister of Defense who said um, Escobar's wife and children and an entourage of 12 or 14 people are at the Rio Negro airport and they have visas to go to the United States and they're going to leave the country. If he succeeded in getting his family out of the country, there would be no inhibitions on him and there was no telling what he might do. The Escobar family and their bodyguards are met at Rio Negro Airport by U.S. DEA agents. They were stopped at the airport in Bogota and stripped of their visas. Who's going to tell me to give Escobar's family's visas back? Nobody. So they're effectively keeping the bait, the bait being the family, in position in the country while Los Pepes apply the pressure against Escobar. Pablo's response to the Americans' block would be swift and deadly. April 1993, with his family prevented from fleeing Colombia and forced back into the hands of the death squad Los Pepes, cocaine king Pablo Escobar exacts his revenge. 
Lula's response was to set off a 300-pound bomb in Bogota that leveled a city block. One of the predictions that we had made was that as we began to tighten the noose on Escobar, things would get more violent, that he would react, and he certainly did. I think we had nine bombs in Bogota in the space of about two months. Hundreds of people killed. Los Pepes responded by kidnapping and murdering Pablo's chief lawyer, Guido Parra. And when they killed Parra, they also took his teenage son and murdered him too. They hung signs around their neck that said, what do you think of the exchange for the bombs, Pablo, and signed them Los Pepes. Despite allegations that Colonel Martinez is cooperating with Los Pepes, he is kept on as commander of the search block. Colonel Martinez stood up and did the job that had to be done. Nobody else wanted to do it. A lot of people were afraid to do it. Colonel Martinez realized that the fight between him and Pablo Escobar was a fight to the death. And at the end, either he or Pablo Escobar was going to be dead. With Centra Spike finding no sign of Pablo's voice on the airways for months, Colonel Martinez requests the support of a Colombian ground surveillance unit. The Colombian National Police were having a lot of success with a small unit that operated portable direction finders in collaboration with Centra Spike. And Colonel Martinez uh, requested that this unit come to Medellin. Martinez receives the unit, but he insists on sending one of its members back home to Bogota. His superiors send him to me on two occasions. And on both occasions, I send him back because he bears my name. The problem was that his own son was one of the men working in this unit. I knew that my equipment would work and we could get good results in Medellin. But he was always resistant to my working in Medellin for my safety. He insisted that he wanted to be involved in the search for Pablo Escobar. It had become a personal as well as familiar problem that was affecting us all. Hugo Jr. was determined to be uh, with the unit and get Pablo Escobar before he could, he could get him, or his sisters or brothers or his mother. After a lot of talking, we came to the conclusion that I could stay in Medellin. We could get no more rest until we captured him. With Escobar's family under police watch in Medellin, Pablo's own son becomes his father's front man. He talked to Juan Pablo uh, just about every day by radio phone, and Juan Pablo became the one person who he trusted, who he could communicate with to do his bidding uh, with the government. While Pablo strategizes with his son, Colonel Martinez's son tries to pinpoint the transmission. I was very sure that I would find Pablo Escobar with this equipment. As the hunt for Escobar gets new life, rumors continue to cloud the search block. Known members of the Medellin cartel are seen meeting with search block officers outside the search block base, including a notorious assassin. An individual that uh, we knew only as Don Bernardo at that time, and I'll admit we did interview him. The Colombian National Police brought him as an, uh, in as an informant, and he provided information about Escobar and his associates. Uh, it was uh, one of those things that happened in a in a dirty war. There was lots of informants. I can't say you know if they were part of those papers or not, but there were informants. Among those working as a secret informant for the Colombian police is Carlos Castaño. I provided information to the police under the code name Alecos. They never knew I was Carlos Castaño, leader of the paramilitaries. We're not afforded the luxury of having informants who are priests. The Bloque de Busque was the good guys. The narcotics traffickers were the bad guys. Washington also becomes concerned about a possible connection between Los Pepes and Delta Force. 
the tactics being employed by Los Pepes were basically the same tactics that Delta Force was in Colombia teaching to the search block. There had been a lot of comments that the Pepes were using like tactics. From what I had heard, they were just ruthless. There's no tactics behind that shit. They just whacked people. Anyway, they were very efficient. In Washington, the fear was not just that uh, members of the Colombian search bloc who had been trained by Delta Force were, in fact, moonlighting as members of Los Pepes, but that Delta Force operators themselves might be participating in these hits. November 12, 1993. The CIA briefs the Pentagon on suspicions of a connection between Delta Force and Los Pepes. A decision is made to pull all American forces from Colombia. I did get word that we were going to be told that our military units were going to be pulled out. And um, I certainly didn't want that to happen. Ambassador Busby was then able to go to work with his connections in the White House to countermand the Joint Chiefs order to remove the people from Colombia, and they stayed. As Busby buys the search block precious time, surveillance teams continue to crisscross Medellin. In late November of 1993, the uh, search block, with the help of Centrospike, was able to pinpoint Pablo's location to a hilltop think outside Medellin. Intelligence had been received that indicated that Escobar was hiding in a small house located on the side of a mountain out in rural areas. When the assault forces hit the house, they burst in and Pablo wasn't there. In fact, Pablo had been talking on the radio, but he would walk up into the woods a short distance from the house so that he'd have a better line of sight uh, communications with his son Juan Pablo in Medellin. So when the search block descended on the farmhouse, Pablo was actually up in the woods. The search block examined the uh, farmhouse where Pablo had been staying, and it was apparent to them that the drug kingpin was living under increasingly strained circumstances. Virtually his entire organization, the Medellin cartel, was totally destroyed. One of the few remaining links to Pablo's empire is his son, Juan Pablo. The Escobar family was staying in a um, apartment in Medellin, and the Los Pepes were sort of picking off people who worked for the family. So they were pretty terrified. Pablo is really desperate. His family is literally in the hands of his enemies. We always had his family under watch 24 hours a day. So he could never touch our families because if he does, his family would also perish. He was always worried about his family's security because that is where the Pepes concentrated their attack efforts, his family. November 27, 1993. Scheming with his son, Juan Pablo, Escobar makes a secret arrangement to evacuate his family to Germany. And word of this, uh, of course, gets back to the embassy because Centrospike is listening to all of Pablo's communications. We learned that they were traveling on a Lufthansa flight from Bogota to Germany. So the United States government goes to work with the Colombian government to assure that the German authorities will not allow the Escobar families into that country. Escobar's families refused entry into Germany and flown directly back to Colombia. They put them up in Hotel Tequendama, which is a large hotel complex in Bogota that's actually owned by the Colombian National Police. And so while publicly they claimed to be protecting Pablo's family, the way that Pablo saw it was that his family had now fallen into the hands of the very people who were likely to kill them. Sure enough, it wasn't a day before Escobar called. When he made the first phone call, I thought, OK, he's, he's finished. Once again, their efforts to get out of the country had been uh, stopped. That's when he started making mistakes. When Pablo Escobar begins to make phone calls to the Hotel de Quindama, we placed everybody in a state of alert. They called the presidential palace in an effort to speak to President Gaviria, threatening to wage all-out war against the state unless they released his family and allowed them to leave Colombia to a safe haven. He started calling everybody. Uh, and that's where he made the mistake of staying in one place too long. And at this uh, critical moment, the government of Colombia announces that they're going to remove 
the protective detail from around the Escobar family. I mean, it was not fair to have so many Colombians at risk, uh, and at the same time having this man with nothing to lose. At this point, just to ratchet up the pressure on Escobar, Los Pepes made a public announcement that they were going to resume their murderous campaign against him. We were closing in on Escobar. We made him get to a point where he had to abandon his bodyguards and he was reduced to hide out almost alone. With the exception of Pablo's family, every resident of the hotel has fled for fear of being caught in the crossfire between Pablo Escobar, the search block, and the Pepe's death squad. The fear is so palpable that little Manuela, who was then eight years old, was overheard walking the halls of the empty hotel, singing a little Christmas carol to herself that she changed the words to, and the words that she was singing were, Los Pepe's are going to kill my father, my mother, and me. December 1993, on the run and at war with the state of Colombia, Pablo Escobar tries to protect his family from the vigilante death squad, Los Pepes. He's desperate to get his family out of Colombia, so he has to continue making phone calls to the Hotel Tequendama. While Pablo is on the phone talking, uh, Centris Bike is listening in, and they fix his location to a neighborhood in Medellin called Los Olivos. Colonel Martinez positioned a lot of his men in parking lots in that neighborhood so they would be poised and ready to move the next time Pablo came up on the radio. Hugo Martinez Jr. and the rest of the search block wait for another Escobar phone call. Every time Pablo got on the uh, radio telephone with his son, Hugo Jr. would be cruising the streets in his uh, telemetry van, trying to zero in on the precise location of the phone call. My father was very clear, saying that the operations cannot go on if Pablo was not talking. Desperate for a way out, Pablo turns to his son, Juan Pablo. Pablo woke up in the morning of December 2nd, the day after his uh, 44th birthday, and had spaghetti for breakfast, and then uh, immediately got on the phone with his son, Juan Pablo. Escobar agrees to answer a phone interview through his son. He instructs his son to accept a list of questions from journalists with the intention of uh, giving interviews that will play on the heartstrings of the Colombian public the fact that the government is using his wife and children as bait. Juan Pablo asked his father for some coaching on how to answer the questions. He also warned Pablo that uh, there were a lot of questions, so this conversation might take a long time. He tells Juan Pablo that they'll get back on the phone a few hours later. This, of course, uh, gave the tip off then to uh, Colonel Martinez and his men that they could be waiting and in position for the phone call that was gonna happen later in the day. Indeed, he called again. We were already located in a house near the zone from where he first called. Hugo immediately started tracking the signal, and the search block followed him out into the city. He's looking at a little monitor uh, that has a line stretched across it, and, as he, and the line either contracts or expands, depending on whether he's getting closer or getting further away. And initially, he locates it in a building where he thinks Pablo must be speaking and the search block launches a raid on this building. But immediately upon launching the raid, Hugo Jr. realizes that he's made a mistake. I read the instruments wrong. They went inside, and I realized he was still talking, and I was very surprised. I had to look again at the instruments, and I found out that there were things that produced an error in the reading. The signal is bouncing off of water in a little canal running down the side of the street. When I realized this and made the subtractions, the arrow changed immediately. So he radios to the search block that he's made a mistake, and he races off thinking that the troops will then get back in their vehicles and follow him. But in fact, no one hears him. So Hugo Jr. and his driver are driving off by themselves, hunting down this signal, and manages to drive right down the correct street in Los Olivos where uh, Pablo is staying. 
he started talking again. And I followed the signal to the point where the equipment showed me the exact location he was in. I turned around and passed by the front again. And with the radio in my hand, I put my hand out the window and started pointing at the window in the second floor. At the same time that I was pointing, I observed the silhouette of Pablo Escobar with the phone in his hand. I was listening, and he looked through the window. We saw each other. He calls me and tells me, I have located him with zero margin of error. Furthermore, he tells me, I'm looking at him. And Colonel Martinez immediately tells him, don't go anywhere. I tell them that they should wait for the search block. But if they had to confront him, to do so. And so Hugo went around to the back of the building, and the, some of the men with him staked out the front door. Pablo Escobar estuvo muy tranquilo. Pablo Escobar was very calm. We did not see him trying to make any escape attempts. He was very still, maybe waiting for luck to help him again. But this time, he was surrounded. Hugo Aguilar's team reaches the scene and immediately makes the assault. Pablo hadn't noticed anything peculiar and was still talking on the phone with his son, Juan Pablo, when the explosive charge went off on the door downstairs. We began going up the stairs. I was up front. Pablo Escobar said, there is something going on here. I'll call you back. And he threw the telephone. He ran to the window, and he went into the abyss. Escobar's lone bodyguard, Lamont, is the first to reach the window. The man that was with Pablo Escobar came out of the house. He jumped, and he headed in our direction, shooting. Lamont attempted to race across the rooftop and was apparently shot on his way across the roof. The force of his momentum carried him right off the roof, and he landed on the grass uh, behind the garage. And then Pablo Escobar appeared. He had two guns in his hands. Pablo began trying to inch his way out along a wall that bordered the rooftop, looking for some avenue of escape. He was talking to the police with such rage and shooting in and out of the house. When he was against the wall, we were not able to get a line of fire to hit him. He started walking to the front. And since the roof goes up, we started seeing more of his body. And at that moment, he fell. When the firing stopped, I looked and I saw him lying on the roof. I took the radio and said, Viva Colombia, Pablo Escobar is dead. The world's most powerful criminal was dead. But just how Pablo Escobar died would remain clouded in mystery. December 2nd, 1993, drug lord Pablo Escobar is gunned down on a rooftop in Medellin, Colombia. Javier, they just killed Escobar. I'm like, what? <laughs> they just killed him in Medellin. It's all over the press. So, I mean, I was happy. I was elated. I became static. I ran around our office space, you know, saying, hey, Pablo's dead. Immediately, I traveled to the location with DEA agent Steve Murphy. I was given the opportunity to go down on the roof to view the body, to visually confirm that it was Escobar. And he climbed to the rooftop and began taking pictures members of the search block posing around the body with rifles like big game hunters. Murphy then gave the camera to uh, the search block and they took pictures of him posing with Escobar's body. Photos of an American agent posed over the dead body caused an uproar in Colombia, where many were unaware that gringos were in on the hunt. It is true that we Americans provided a lot of assistance to the Colombians. Uh, we, we 
certainly did that. But in the last analysis, the success was Colombia's. It was a Colombian operation from start to finish. Colonel Martinez, Colonel Aguilar, these guys are truly great heroes in, uh, in Colombia history. Yo creo que... I believe I have performed a great service to my country. At the end, I considered a victory for the world. While there was no question that Pablo was marked for death, how he died remains a subject of conjecture. The official version of Pablo's death is that he came running out from that wall across the rooftop with a gun in each hand, you know, screaming at the police and swearing at them as they, as they gunned him down. El tiro de, de la pistola the shot from my gun was the one that perforated his heart. And the one from the R-15 went through one of his ears and came out through the other ear. That is why we were able to end the story of Pablo Escobar. It may be true, but Pablo's usual modus operandi in these circumstances was not to stand and fight, but to flee. And so it seems more likely to me that Pablo, hearing the door being broken down in his house, would have tried to jump out the back window and run away. What makes sense to me is that Pablo was trying to run away across the rooftop when he was hit. He was shot three times. One of the bullets hit him in the leg, one of them hit him in the torso, and the third went right in his right ear. It's definite that the bullet that went in his right ear killed him. What makes more sense to me is that the bullets that hit his leg and his torso would have knocked him down, certainly, uh, and that the final shot that killed him was most likely administered by somebody standing right over top of him. I would not, I mean, I would not put it past the cop going out there and just say, hey, we're going to make sure this guy's dead. I think he was shot up close. They wanted to make sure he was dead. Whoever it was knew he wasn't to be taken alive. There have been uh, a lot of accusations that um, there was a, a coup de grace shot after Escobar was down. I saw no indications of that. It's always possible that someone made a great shot like that from a distance. But the Colombian National Police had tremendous incentive to kill Pablo Escobar. Nobody wanted to see him arrested again. And besides that, Escobar, in the course of this manhunt, had killed scores of the, of the policemen who were searching for him. So there was a tremendous amount of anger and hatred in these men searching for him. So it makes more sense to me that Escobar was knocked down by a few bullets from a distance and that he was finally killed with a coup de grace. Some believe that the final blow was actually delivered by an American. Within the Delta Force community, there's sort of a legend about Escobar's death, which holds that he was killed by Delta Force. It was not so much a victory for Delta, but a victory for the whole special ops community. Delta Force would, would have known Pablo's general location at the same time that the search block did and would have had an opportunity to place snipers in that neighborhood. When Pablo came running out on the rooftop, given the marksmanship of a Delta sniper, it's not beyond the possible that, that uh, an American from a distance put that bullet in Escobar's right ear. I think the most likely explanation is that Escobar was killed by the Colombian National Police, by the search block. They had every capability and every desire to see Pablo Escobar dead themselves. There were no Americans involved in it. That was the Colombian National Police taking care of business. The legacy of the Los Pepe's death squad has cast an even darker shadow on the history of the hunt. There's ample evidence today that the search block and the Los Pepes worked hand in hand. And of course, the whole Colombian search block was a creature of the U.S. government, essentially, because they were funded and trained and led by U.S. special forces. Los Pepes worked with the tacit cooperation of the U.S. government. The Colombian authorities did not oppose us either. The members of Centrospike who I've interviewed said that there was never any doubt in their mind 
that there was a direct connection between the information that they were collecting and the information that Los Pepes were acting upon. So there's very little question in my mind that the effort to track down Escobar was a collaboration between the United States government, the Colombian National Police, and Los Pepes. I never saw any evidence that it was a Colombian government operation. Um, it, it, was, it was a bloodbath, though. It truly was. Los Pepes. The Pepes operated on their own accord by themselves. For Martinez to say that there was no, I mean, there was no connection there, you know. I mean, I, he can say whatever he wants to, but uh, there was a connection. And in my opinion, the greatest damage caused to the Medellin cartel and the Pablo Escobar and his organization was done by the Los Pepes. The Pepes were not a factor in what we were there to do. But were they a factor in getting Pablo? Yeah, big time. Today, Pablo's place as the world's king of cocaine has been taken over by the Marxist rebel movement known as FARC. FARC guerrillas are responsible for over 70% of the cocaine that reaches the streets of America. And like Pablo Escobar, they have waged a campaign of terror against the Colombian state. The FARC has inherited a lot of the methods that uh, Escobar used, the car bombs, the kidnappings, uh, the terrorism, the terrorism against civilians. So in that sense, uh, they're looking very much alike, unfortunately, for Colombia. As America supports Colombia in its war against the FARC guerrillas, they may once again share a dark ally. I am the leader of the AUC. We exist to fight the FARC guerrillas because the state is not strong enough to fight them themselves. Carlos Castaño has admitted that he was one of the early members of Los Pepes. He, of course, has gone on to become one of the right-wing paramilitary leaders in Colombia. With the tacit support of the Colombian army, the AUC has waged a dirty war against the FARC, allegedly massacring thousands of civilians deemed sympathetic to the FARC guerrillas. He's regarded by many Colombians as a hero, but also by many as a violent criminal. There's a real close relationship between the Colombian army and the AUC, in the same way that there was a relationship between the Los Pepes and the police. You know what I'm saying? Like Los Pepes, the AUC has officially been denounced by the US and placed on its list of terrorist organizations. But I suspect that just as in the case with Los Pepes, the uh, paramilitary units will continue to do what they've always done because ultimately it's going to benefit the United States government and the Colombian government in their war against the guerrillas. I think they're a necessary evil. As long as they're the enemy of my enemy, they're going to stay alive and functioning. As Colombia and America square off against the worst enemies they've ever faced, Los Pepes provide a keen example of the central dilemma of modern so-called discretionary warfare. The issue of the Los Pepes, it's one of the central ethical issues involved whenever you use military force. And that is, how far are you willing to go to succeed? When you make the decision to go to war, you've essentially decided that the situation is beyond the bounds of normal law and order. When the people are terrorists, but they have a good network, uh, it's very difficult to catch them. I mean, the U.S. has seen that uh, recently with bin Laden. When a person has a clandestine organization, it's not, it's not easy. You're facing an enemy who's trying to kill you. In those kind of circumstances, the ultimate goal is to succeed, is to win, not to necessarily play by the rules. In fact, sometimes the circumstances will force you to play by the same kinds of tactics that your enemy is using in order to prevail. While most Colombians have lived with it for their entire lives, most Americans have only recently known the reality of terror. I think that Americans have to steel themselves to the reality of war, that if you're going to war, you have to face up to the ugly facts about what war is. 